Here's where we left off on Friday. We were looking at how optimal foraging assumes that there's a limited amount of energy to use in order to capture prey. If you had all the energy in the world, you could capture all the prey you want, but if there's a limited amount, then there's only a limited amount of foraging distance an organism is willing to take in order to get net energy uh, re reward in terms of kilocalories. So you may notice that the distance worth foraging for a larger prey is, of course, a larger distance than the maximum distance worth going for a smaller prey. At a certain point, if you had to climb to the top of Mount Eleanor to eat a squirrel, that's not enough energy, and you end up losing more energy than you gain. So that's kind of related to the principle of allocation, because energy spent foraging is energy that cannot be used in growth. So we're going to look at this a little more um, exactly in optimal foraging models. So the optimal foraging model is going to be looking at several distinct variables here. And these variables are each something that is kind of uh, easy to grasp and easy to apply, really. So, of course, we have the prey population, N. And we're going to see N used later on as the size of a population. In fact, we're going to see it at some points referring to predator-prey interactions. But that's Laca Volterra, and that's later. We also have C, the energy expended while searching. So this is how hard it is to search for the prey. If the prey has uh, no ability to run away whatsoever, like say a blueberry bush, the energy expended searching is probably not very high. Then we have handling time. Again, with a blueberry bush, this is just taking the berries off of, a, off of it. If you're thinking about something like a red huckleberry bush, however, the handling time is quite a while to get enough berries off of there to actually make a meal. And this handling time can also be fighting and opening a prey. So you see these coyotes here, and they've finally mastered foraging theory by waiting near a deer crossing of a road. Essentially, they have taken their handling time to zero because you do not have to fight a prey that has been hit by a Buick. So digesting prey could also be taken as a method of handling time if you consider that as time spent digesting prey when other prey cannot be captured, save for large ambush predators. And last, we have energy. So the energy that is being spent or received can be taken in uh, either way here to see how much energy is going to be in searching and how much energy is going to be received after eating the prey. And the use of this, of these variables gives us an equation. So here we have our, our optimal foraging equation. So I'm going to put some ones on here because this is for one type of prey. So you have energy per unit time is going to be equal to the prey population, the energy spent hunting them, so E1, energy for one, minus the cost there. So that's the uh, the searching one. So here's the you know energy for each one of these guys. Sorry, it's not energy, but it's searching is energy per unit minus the cost of energy, and then over one plus maybe one h one. So we see here the larger the handling cost per unit prey, the smaller amount of energy can be received per time. But the larger the prey population and less cost searching for it, the larger the energy per unit time. So you see with this equation, it's good to have a prey population that is a large population, gives a lot of energy, and does not require a lot of handling cost. And this is the equation for a single type of prey. If you refer to your book, you can actually see what happens if you increase the diet breadth. So let's look at different diets. Organisms can often eat more than one type of prey. You look at the veritable buffet that's out there, and you can see that there are different types of prey with different amounts of handling costs, different amounts of search times needed, and different populations. So think about when a predator would choose one prey over another. If, for example, you had walnuts, peanuts, and almonds all still in their shell, 
and you had to pick what to eat, well, you'd probably pick the peanuts if you didn't have uh, any nut opening device because that's the least handling time for the most energy. However, if one of those was out of a shell, the handling goes way down. So think about prey in terms of how much handling and how hard it is to find. A very populous prey organism, something that can be found very easily, is going to be, it's going to be preferred because you've essentially maximized this population right here and minimized the time spent searching. So there are a lot of factors influencing prey choice, mainly which can be looked at through this equation. And this gives us the ability to make certain predictions. So if we were to test this out in nature, we would see, we would hypothesize that the best prey will be what is most common, but also what gives the most energy. So here we see sunfish eating different types of prey. So the most abundant prey in the environment are approximately one millimeter long. But to maximize the rate of energy intake, it's better for sunfish, bluegill sunfish, to eat things that are four millimeters or longer. So one millimeter is the most common, four millimeters or longer are needed to really maintain energy. So of course it'd be great to have the biggest prey, but they're really, really rare, require a long search time. So optimality kind of balances this out, giving diets and blue, bluegill sunfish diets that are mainly prey that's four millimeters in length. And that's pretty much what's optimal. It's the thing that can be found the most, but provides the most energy. So somewhere between the most energy, which would be biggest, and found the most, which is smallest, is this nice middle ground of about four millimeters. We can see this in several other studies, and we can also interesting, interestingly see this in the spread of roots. So each root that a plant puts out is going to essentially represent a search. So that is a search for nutrients as opposed to a search for prey. If we increase the soil nitrogen, every search is successful because every search is going to be finding nitrogen. And you would then expect the plant to invest less time searching because the prey is more abundant. And that's what we see in the root to shoot ratio. A high root to shoot ratio means a large amount of search per unit growth. And we see that the time searching compared to growth decreases as the availability of soil nitrogen increases. So do remember that it's not just animals hunting for prey that are going to be using optimal foraging but indeed it is going to determine the plants and how they are going to be growing and it even determines mating, which is going to be the second part of this lecture available as a separate video.